Don, Frozone, watch out. Here we go. <laughs> All right. So today, we're jumping into the series. Go ahead and bring up my stuff. Uh, Unafraid, we're dealing with crime this week. Uh, again, want to thank uh, Lorna for her good work last week, which really was a part of uh, this series because of her own transformation that's happened and her facing her fears. I just, I love it. Uh, so refreshing. And uh, you didn't know this, but the first, the first service didn't get the full butterfly last week. And I heard you guys clapping because I needed to go get something in the office. And I heard you applauding. And the first service clapped along with that finale song. And I thought, wow, they really like this song. <laughs> and then I come in, and there's the butterfly, man, giving love bugs. That was gold. I mean, that was just gold. So thank you again. That was awesome. And today uh, we're talking about crime and how that messes with us. And so on the next slide, this gives you an idea of where we're going today. Uh, I want to find out what your African animal avatar is. Uh, we're going to talk about false expectations appearing real. I nuance this a little bit because that's the way I learned it. Uh, Hamilton in his book talks about false events appearing real. Kind of the same thing. And we're going to talk about cognitive therapy. We're going to talk about Peter Robert Shaw and Lakin Shaw and Holly Tarr and fear. Then we're going to talk about fear in the bushes, Adam and Eve and you and me. And then we're going to walk through the unafraid process. So that's what we got to get through in just five minutes. We can do it. <laughs> Well, not really. First of all, just call it out to me. What's, what's your animal avatar out there? Cheetah, elephant. Cheetah, elephant. Is that because you're, you're stubborn, Sharon? Is that why you said that? <laughs> uh, anybody? Uh, so I heard a cheetah, an elephant. Cougar. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Lions. Okay. Any hippopotamuses or rhinos or anything? Which one? What's he? Hippo. Hippo. <laughs> hey. They're the deadliest animal in Africa, man. Look it up. They're the ones you got to watch out for. The lions, no, no big deal, but those hippopotamus, man, watch out. Uh, they always tell us, man, we're on safari because I've been on several of these going to Kenya. We take the staff uh, to Nairobi National Park because they can't afford it and it's dirt cheap for us, so we make a day of it and it's, it's great and we are pretty lucky most of the time, but they're always like, you know, you're probably not going to see a hippo, but if you do, stay away because they just come at you and, and nail you. No, but no impalas in the room? Impalas are beautiful. Uh, they're very afraid. Uh, in fact, if you get very close to an impala with your mutatu or whatever you're riding in, uh, you're not going to get too close because they're super skittish. And Hamilton's been on safaris, so he talks about this in this particular chapter of his book, uh, that we're all more impala-like than, we uh, than we may admit. In fact, he found out that when it comes to crime, uh, we are significantly impala-like. Uh, so when our country uh, citizens were polled about the issue of crime, if you lump together people who are very, very anxious and fearful about crime happening to them, or people who are fairly afraid, pretty afraid, and anxious about crime happening to them, that combined group is 79% of United States citizens are a little bit consumed, more than just a little, but they're thinking about crime that might happen to them. That's a lot of people. And as I mentioned last week, and as Hamilton uh, brought out uh, a little bit um, uh, in his book for sure, uh, he thinks, and I agree, that part of the reason why this is the case is because uh, we have it in front of us all the time. Bad stuff, all the time. Uh, news flashes, I mean, it's always bad news, right? You don't get a news alert because somebody did something awesome. You get a news alert because something terrible just happened. And it's constantly in front of us. And maybe, I mean, your regular old news, let's not talk about ones that we know are biased and they're generally political because that, we know that exists. And they use fear rhetoric, too, to prop up each of their sides. We get that. But I'm just talking about regular old news, CBS and Cron 4 and ABC, that you're watching it before you go to bed and first thing in the morning and all that. What bleeds still leads. And so it's always in front of us, and it gives us this false expectation, perhaps, that things are worse than they are. At least that's what we got to decide, is, is our reality and our culture that worthy of our anxiety? 
And that's what we're going to talk through, false expectations appearing real. Are our fears, is our anxiety rooted in reality, or is it false? Now, cognitive therapy works with this stuff. And the methodology that they have is if, if you have a, a horrific idea in mind or a horrific thing you're trying to get through and you're worried about that thing repeating, what they actually do in therapy is they have you identify whatever that thing is, that idea or that threat that you sense, and they have you hold it with skepticism. Skepticism. In other words, right out of the gate they, they teach, as soon as you hear about this terrible thing, oh my goodness, there's a, there's a burglar on the loose, or, or oh my goodness, there's a, a, brash of, a rash of crime happening in Napa, that you hear it and you hold that horrific idea, uh, but you're skeptical from the get-go. And the reason they want you to be skeptical is to force yourself to take pause, to not just react, because we love to react. That's why <laughs> this stuff happens in the media, is to get you to react, to get you to stay tuned. But if we approach whatever subject it is with skepticism, that forces us to say, well, that could be, that sounds really bad, but let's find out what's really happening first. And then part of the cognitive therapy, therapy process is then to spend some time actually digging into the facts behind the thing that you're concerned about, whatever that horror is. And then after you've identified that, sometimes that is enough. That just coming to grips with the fact shifts us over to a place where we can breathe more deeply and walk more smoothly. But they also recognize in therapy that this has to be reminded of us. Otherwise, we fall right back into the fear. If, if we're constantly being um, assaulted with information that's bad and scary all the time, if that's our culture that we live in, and it is, then something has to be done to offset that. And so these reminders that we place ourselves are, are, around and integrate into our lives serve as that kind of buffer so that we're not consumed by our fear. And I can walk you through how, uh, how I've worked through this process to a degree or how, how I would if it remained to be an issue with this next thing, me, my daughter, and Holly Tar and fear. So my daughter will turn 19 years old in three weeks. Uh, that means she's 18 years old now. <laughs> in, case, in case you, you know, didn't put that together. I knew Holly Tarr uh, in high school. She and I went to school together. And uh, uh, she was one of these rising stars. Um, we did theater together. Uh, she was two years younger than me, uh, and uh, she got big roles right away. I think her dad was in the industry on some level uh, in uh, the Lansing, Michigan area. We went to Okemos High School. Um, but as a sophomore, um, she was getting serious roles. Um, not quite leading roles, uh, but like second tier lead roles. Uh, so my senior year, and I, so I would have done, uh, by the time I graduated, I did at least four shows uh, with her. Um, and that means I got to know her well. She was a good friend. Uh, we would spend about eight weeks uh, working on a show, uh, going through lines, spending two hours a day, uh, getting our blocking down, our lines down, polishing it up, and then, you know, four to six performances, whatever. Big time commitment, you get to know your cast uh, really, really well. So my last show was Carousel. Um, I was the lead, um, and she was uh, not, the, not the opposite lead, but like I said, one tier down, which was still a whopper role. Um, and the reason she got it is because she was really good. She had this beautiful voice. Um, she was a beautiful girl, uh, and she was a really good actress. I mean, she knew her craft, and she performed it. Uh, really, really well. And uh, so I graduated, and they continued doing shows. She continued starring the shows. In my sophomore year, uh, I got a terrible phone call in April. And the phone call was that my good friend Holly was dead. That she'd been killed. Murdered. Uh, she uh, spent spring break in San Diego uh, with her brother who lived there. 
and uh, she was out uh, swimming in the pool while he was at work or whatever, just enjoying spring break. Because when, uh, when you live in Michigan and it's April, <laughs> you, you want to leave. <laughs> That's what you want. <laughs> and so she went to a sunny, warm spot, San Diego, pretty reliably sunny and warm. And uh, she went back to her brother's apartment and, uh, you know, was going to get ready for the evening, whatever she was going to do. And uh, some guy named Cleophas uh, Prince Jr. Uh, had snuck into his apartment somehow. And when she was getting out of the shower, he surprised her, uh, stabbed her to death, raped her. Awful, awful. Um, Cleophas Prince Jr. was a serial killer in the early 1990s. Holly was, I think, his fourth victim in that general area. Same MO every time. Obviously, mental health issues. Um, uh, Holly's death in particular was instrumental in helping uh, tie together uh, him to other, and actually catch him, uh, because Holly had this ring that was given to her by her mother. And when they were interrogating uh, Cleophas Prince Jr., uh, they also talked to his girlfriend who was wearing that ring. Uh, and I think he had six or seven victims before they got him. Horrible, horrible. Well, that happened when Holly was 18 years old. I have a daughter who's 18 years old. Uh, who lives in Southern California, going to school, who next year uh, will live in Switzerland, studying abroad, and is making it her aim to see every inch of Europe. <laughs> um, weekend adventures, uh, a very long plane ride away. Why am I not coming unglued? Well, talk to me in September. <laughs> You know, it would be very easy uh, to, in light of what happened to my friend, a good friend, Holly, it would be very easy for me to flip all the way out. Now, part of the reason I'm not flipping out is that happened for Holly, I think, in 1990, 90 or 91, somewhere in there. At 90, that uh, would be. And, uh, you know, I was a couple years from getting married. I was several years from having a kid many more years from having a teenage daughter. Um, so distance helps with that. Uh, but one of the things that um, I know that I did in terms of alleviating my fear is work through that cognitive therapy process some, uh, which I'll take you through uh, in a moment. And in general with crime, I want to take you through some of these things uh, even now. So I'm going to show you some stats because when it comes to our fears, and especially crime, uh, facts are our friends. So on the next slide, um, you've got a couple graphs, which I know you can easily make out from your seat. Uh, what I want you to see here, which is difficult for you to see, and these are on my blog. If you want to look at them, it'll, it'll uh, publish at 12 o'clock today, and you can get a closer look at these. Um, but these show three different things. On the left-hand side, you have Napa Property Crime Index. And on the right side, you have Napa Violent Crime Index. And this takes a look at what's happened over uh, the last, uh, let's see, 18 years. So 2017, trailing back to 1999. Uh, ever since I got here, in fact. Uh, so, and what I hope you can see, they, they look at Napa, California, and uh, the national averages. The national averages is orange, uh, California is blue, and then green is Napa. What I want you to see is that in general, nationally, um, crime, both in violent crime and in property crime, has been going down, not up. And you can do your own research on this stuff. It's not hard to do. But crime's been going generally down. Um, and even in Napa, it's been a little sporadic, but generally, it's not, it's not where the national averages are on cr violent crime or property crime. Um, it's, it's trending downwards. 
I think it's because I moved to Napa in 1999. <laughs> I, I can't guarantee that, but it could be. On the next slide, we see some more graphs that you can't make out. Uh, let's get to that one. Uh, next slide, please. There it is. Uh, so this is a 2016 property crime comparison. This one just shows Napa versus California versus uh, the national averages. And again, in most categories, save one or two between both things, uh, Napa is safer than most places in California, and Napa is safer than most places in the United States. There are just a couple areas that uh, Napa uh, seems to be just a little bit of an anomaly on. Uh, one of them has to do, let's see, what is it? Um, burglary, uh, Napa is a little higher than the national average and a little higher than the California average. And on the violent crime side, Napa is lower than everything except uh, we're a little higher in rape, uh, unfortunately, uh, than California as a whole and the nation. But generally speaking, uh, California is a pretty good place to live, pretty safe place to live, uh, and you're pretty safe. Uh, if we go on the next slide, uh, we get an idea about what this actually looks like if you break down the numbers. So this shows um, 2016 crime, both on the property and the violence side, and then uh, 2018 projected crime uh, levels. And what you need to see except for that issue of rape. Uh, in every other category, the projections are that this year is going to be a reduction in crime across the board from two years ago. In other words, the people who put this stuff together are fairly confident that not only is Napa pretty safe compared to the rest of the nation and the rest of California, but we're actually getting safer. It's not getting worse. And like I said, you can study these things on your own. When it comes to violent crime like murder, that's the far right uh, cone thing there. Uh, they were projecting that there would be one murder in Napa this year. Uh, there'd be 40 cases of rape, which is awful. Um, that there'd be 33 cases of burglary and 297 uh, cases of aggravated assault. Those are all awful things. But again, compared to the national averages and compared to California, it's not as bad as we would think. And then when you back it up a little bit and factor in two things. One factor in the reality that uh, Napa, California is 75,000 people approximately. Um, that's a fairly small percentage of people experiencing this stuff. And then if you take it one step further, and if you factor in your ethnicity, if you are in our country and in our city, if you're white, and if you are of Asian descent, you're just all the more safer. Uh, the more color you throw on your skin, in fact, uh, the worse the stats are for you. So most of you here today, I hope we become increasingly colorful at Crosswalk. Uh, but most of you are sitting here today, statistically, you don't have a lot to worry about. It's probably not going to happen to you. That means we should be concerned about our brothers and sisters and wonder why is it happening to them more than us. Absolutely, get on board with that. But in terms of you sleeping well at night, probably going to be all right. On the next slide, uh, give you a little bit harder data to look at. So murders, let's talk about that. There were 15,000 murders last year in the United States. If that's all you hear every day, there were 15,000 murders every day in the United States. You're going to freak out because that could be you. I mean, over 50 states, oh my goodness. I mean, that's a lot of murders. Yeah, it is a lot of murders. But it's out of 327 million people. And the odds are that uh, the way it works out is you got a 1 in 25,000 uh, odds uh, that you're going to die by murder. That is a 99.9955% chance that you will not die by murder. If you could get into an investment that gave you that high of a probability, you would, you'd be all in, right? That is about as good as it can get. So if you have any anxiety at all about you yourself being murdered anytime soon or ever, Remember this, it is extremely unlikely. And I think with my daughter, this helps because I realize that it is extremely unlikely 
I mean extremely unlikely that harm is going to come to her. Now, does that mean that I look at the stat and I'm like, well, Lakin, just, you know, do whatever you want, leave the car doors open, walk wherever you want without anybody, don't, don't think about anything. In fact, roll the dice, risk it a little. Is that what I say to my daughter? No. I say, be smart, be wise. I mean, the FBI gives them tips for being a student abroad, so they're wanting students to pay attention to all this stuff, and they should, but given all of their normal, thoughtful, precautionary work and the reality of this, I can sleep pretty good. Am I gonna be, it's my right to be a parent and worry, okay? You can't take that away from me. <laughs> but this helps a lot because I know the odds are tremendously in her favor. But look at some of this other stuff. If you want to freak out a little bit more, you're twice as likely to die by medical error. So we have some medical professionals here in this room. What's your problem, man? What are you doing? I didn't mean to do that, but hey, what's your problem? Seriously, work on that. No. <laughs> so 250,000 people die a year. That's a 1 in 14,000 chance. But still, keep the odds in mind. Keep your percentages in mind. That's a 99.9938% chance you will not die this year from medical error. Let's talk about one you should worry about. That actually should be our radar and should be the headline, but isn't. There are 610,000 deaths by heart disease alone in the United States every year. That accounts for 25% of deaths in America. Heart disease is the leading cause of death worldwide. The irony is, is that one is largely preventable. Preventable. Why isn't that leading every night? We lost a bunch more people to heart disease uh, pay attention to what you're eating. Know what your genetic code is setting you up for so you can mitigate against that. But that's really not it, is it? 25% of U.S. deaths. It's largely preventable. If you want to be nervous about something, don't be, don't be so nervous about the killer with the knife or the gun in their hands. Be nervous about the killer that's deep fried. Because that one has a far greater likely of hunting you down and messing with your life and shortening it. Pay attention to that. Well, it turns out that our nature of being skittish, of being impala-like, even if we think we're hippopotamuses or elephants or giraffes or cheetahs or lions or whatever, it actually is hardwired into us. It's a reptilian brain thing. We're hardwired to be fearful. That's normal. It protects us. There are good parts of it. Uh, and um, there's a way to frame it uh, that our Jewish ancestors helped us with a lot. And that actually, you know, you, we don't often talk about, well, we do more here, I think, than other spaces perhaps, but we don't often talk about why we have the stories that we have in our Bible. And Genesis is one of those examples of how did we get this thing in the first place? And Genesis, particularly those, well, the whole book means beginnings, but the beginnings of the beginnings in the first few chapters of Genesis they are there to tell the Jewish understanding of the God that they have discovered. And that Jewish rendering of who they've discovered God to be stood in contrast to the gods represented in other cultures or what they experienced in other cultures. And so they had a story to tell, and their story was different. Uh, we've talked some of this in years past and weeks past even, but their story starts off with God creating the heavens and the earth giving God credit for the creative energy and force, however that worked, and that it was done in an orderly process. It just didn't happen whimsically, but, but there was a process involved. And that every step of the way, this God who is so creative and always about it, at the end of every uh, phase of creation, looked at what had been created and said, it's good stuff. That looks good. And then he'd get busy with the next one. And God would continue to create crowning achievement being humanity. God looking at humanity and not just saying good, but you know the answer, very good. I thought you knew the answer. <laughs> you just kind of looked at me blank. God said, thank you very much. You need to understand that is so familiar to us if we've grown up in church especially. 
But that would be such a new way of thinking to other cultures because the God that had been represented to them through their mythologies and experiences was, this God can't stand us. This God doesn't really like earth. They kind of have to deal with us, but, you know, we're really, we're the chessboard, and they're messing the pawns around. They don't really care about us at all. Actually, of all creation, they're kind of annoyed by human beings the most of all people. They look at us as noisy, and they had their own, like the flood story in other cultures. It was a response to us noisy human beings. So the other cultures were saying, oh, the gods, they don't, they don't really like creation. Uh, they especially don't like people. So this Jewish idea was very different. And then the story rolls a little forward. And we get a different creation story about uh, uh, Adam and Eve. And it starts off with Adam and, uh, you know, um, it's very good. The dust divinity clod thing is happening. And all these animals are created. And his task is to name all the animals. He names all the animals. But... There was no suitable helper found for Adam, so the word gives us. And so, uh, a special creature was created out of Adam. That's just to show likeness there. Very different and yet very much alike. And that was Eve. And Adam is very excited, you know, when he sees her. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. I mean, it's this beautiful you know, symmetry that's happening. And all is well. Uh, God comes along to, uh, he's already told uh, Adam what the deal is, and he's supposed to tell Eve, and the deal was, hey, hey kids, you're in paradise. This is an all-inclusive resort. You just eat whatever you want, whatever you please. Have fun. Just go have a blast. Do whatever you want to do. What could happen? Except this. Don't eat of this one particular tree. Uh, the knowledge of good and evil, because uh, if you do, uh, that's just not going to go well at all. Don't, don't do that. Uh, it'll, it'll lead to your death, actually, so don't do, don't do that one. So we can eat anything, just to be clear, God. This, we got full rain here. Yep, just that one tree, right? Yep, got it. All right, so he's created. She gets the memo. Things are going along fine. They're enjoying their time in paradise. And then we know how the story goes as the snake in the grass comes along and starts asking questions about Eve. Now, in antiquity, especially in the Jewish culture, again, we've got to reshape our ears and our eyes on this, but in antiquity, this was not looked as a devil figure by the Jewish tradition. Uh, that was way, way, way in the future. But in antiquity, the way that this w was uh, recognized was like any other mythology of any other culture, that you have this character comes in that is going to test your mettle a little bit, see what you're really made of, well, kind of like a district attorney. Let's see who you really are, how much you really believe this stuff. That's the idea. And so the snake in the grass comes, starts asking Eve all these questions about, so what did he really say? You're really going to die? All, you can't eat any of the fruit? And she's like, no, 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 we can eat everything except for that one tree. Why? Well, because we'll die. You're not really going to die. You really think that's what it's about? And starts messing with their head. Now, the irony here is, is Adam is just away at a distance right over there. He's like standing with the beam over there. She's not calling out to him. He's not coming to her. That's weird. So they've got a couple mistakes happening here. They needed to be together on this. At any moment, she could ask for clarification. At any moment, he could have come over uh, to rescue her, to help her in this uh, discussion, but they didn't. And she took the bite and then uh, convinced him it was a good idea, and they both took the bite and found out that things were very different. They didn't die. Well, it's not right away. Uh, but at that moment... Uh, their eyes were opened. They both recognized that they were naked, and somehow the way they viewed that was negative and bad, whereas before it was natural and beautiful and good. Isn't that interesting? Well, that's where we catch up with the story that we can relate to very much. So on the next slide, this is also in your bulletin as well. So they've eaten the fruit. They know they're naked. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Now my question for you, uh, this is an easy one, is does God know everything? Yes. Thank you. 
Why in the world did God need to ask this question? He's not asking it because he doesn't know. God is asking this question to bring Adam into awareness of what is going on. Where are you? So Adam has to say, well, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. He was naked before. But now he's naked again, but this time he's afraid. Who, who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Again, <laughs> already knows the answer to the question. He's asking this so that Adam will ask the question. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? Again, he knows the answer to the question. He's doing this for Adam's benefit. You know, the way the stories would work uh, in antiquity and in the Jewish tradition, and in, this is well reflected in thousands of pages of writing uh, from rabbinical work, is they would get their teeth on a story like this and they would go after it and go after it and after it and after it and they would milk this thing in so many different ways and I want to tell you that they still are. They're still talking about these stories and how they interface with our life today and what, what truth we can get about ourselves and who God is and how these two things go together. That's what the process is about. And today I want you to recognize that Adam was afraid, that I think he struggled with fear, false expectations appearing real. Because every cultural experience around him and maybe in his lizard brainness. Uh, he thought to himself, I have done something I wasn't supposed to do. And I'm afraid of what God is going to do with me because my gut tells me, uh-oh, it's going to be really, really bad. And God is going to come at me with condemnation and judgment. I might lose my life on this thing. That's the fear that Adam had in his mind. But that's not how the story affirms who God is because the story has God walking in the garden not with a sword not with a pitchfork not with a judge's gavel just strolling along and my hunch is that his voice was calm hey Adam where are you man where are you Adam hello anybody out there just to coax him out and Adam had to have at least enough assurance at the earliest stage of this dialogue that God was not going to kill him by the tone of God's voice that he took the risk to speak. Well, he doesn't sound that mad. He's not stomping around. I'm kind of peeking through the leaves here and it doesn't look like he's got handcuffs or anything. I'm over here. I hid because I was afraid. I was afraid. And he lived with this fear for a bit. And finally comes out, they have this conversation of accountability. The earliest rendering of this passage is not sin entering the world, it's humanity coming of age. It's people learning what it means to be grown-ups. This is a shift in their reality. This is kids flying out of the nest. This is getting out of the cocoon. This is becoming who we are meant to become. It's knowing that we're not the children anymore. We're no longer safe in this. We're going to make mistakes. They're going to cost us. But the overwhelming image of who God is in this process is not condemning, not judging, but redeeming and restoring. So there was a false expectation on Adam's part that we can borrow from now. Because our expectations here, again, somewhere wired in us, it's this uh-oh thing. And I've heard it a hundred times from people who find out I'm a pastor and say, oh, I can't come to church. Why is that? Well, because the roof would cave in or, you know, whatever. And I'd be like, well, we've got really good insurance. That could actually be a win for us. So please come. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's kind of that's the way the dance goes because they have this assumption that God is going to be angry with them and is going to smite them or something like that. But the very first picture of a mistake in the Bible that we have 
the tone and presence of God is loving and graceful. Of saying, okay, yep, this happens. Um, there's consequences here. Let me tell you what those are. Which is an act of love? This is how it's going to go for you kids uh, going forward. There's going to be work. It's going to be hard. doesn't mean you're dying. Uh, sweat's good for you. Um, you're going to survive. It's going to be all right. Uh, you're going to get pregnant, Eve, um, and there's going to be weird things happen to your body, uh, and then you're going to give birth to that thing. You're not going to like that, <laughs> but you're going to live through it. It's going to be all right, uh, and then you're going to like the end result. Uh, so, you know, hold on. It's going to be okay. And, oh, here, you're still naked. Nakedness isn't bad. Don't want you to think that, but I don't want you to be cold tonight. Uh, so here are some clothes. That's the nature of God with all of this. Now, if we could whisper into Adam and Eve's ears, right after they took the bite of fruit and were trembling about what's going to happen, what's God going to do to me, and if we could just say to them from our vantage point, hey, it's going to be okay, because the God who made you, the God who said you're very good, uh, that is the nature of God, is to be very, very good. Um, he's going to love you through this. It's not going to leave, leave you hanging. Jesus, many moons later, uh, would say this wonderful thing, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life, talking about this life now. But then he went on to say in John three seventeen, For I did not come into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved, might be shalomed, might be made whole, restored. That's what we're seeing here. This thing of being impala-like and riddled with fear as a false expectation appearing real, that is very deep in our bones. But the good news is we don't have to keep living that way because we have the story. <laughs> because we have the knowledge and time and history to look and see, oh, God really is loving. We look at the person of Jesus and we see what he did and how he reacted with all people everywhere, especially broken people who were afraid. And he was one who would come alongside them, lift them up, become their greatest champions for their well-being. This is the God that we have reflected in the face of Jesus. It's the God you have. So what's your fear? And specifically, are you afraid of crime? Because let's take a look at the process on our last screen here. This is the unafraid process. He still be, uh, builds it on this sort of a loose acronym on, uh, on fear, face, examine, attack, and release. But he fleshes it out a little bit. So the process of becoming less fearful, more unafraid, is to face your fears with faith. What that means is not, not the idea that God makes everything happen. Uh, for a reason, like we're just chess pieces. That, that's a really primitive and really horrible theological place to come to. I understand where it comes through. It's bad theology. Just plain out bad theology. So whatever, every time you hear that, because uh, that would mean then that uh, somehow God chose Holly Tar to be killed by a serial killer? I don't think so. It causes X person over here to struggle with cancer, but not that guy over there. And I mean, that, that does not add up. It's bad theology. So just know that. But what it does mean is, is that we have this Genesis 1 to 3 orientation toward the very nature of God and creation itself. That God is ultimately and fundamentally good. That creation was made to go through ebbs and flows of life and death, but that it is, it is still good. And that is still going in that, that direction. It is regenerative. It is beautiful. It is majestic. It still reflects the Spirit of God. And so do we. Trusting that that, that, that is the primary pull of all of creation and the God behind it, that's what I mean. That's what Hamilton means by facing our fears with faith. But somehow at the end of the day, God is still with me through this. And that's really important. Because I know hard times are coming for me. I've already lost a large number of people uh, that I love. It's because I'm a pastor. And when people die, that's hard. Because even though I don't always say it or show it in the best ways, I love you. And I hate it when that happens. And it grieves me. I've lost hundreds of people. Hundreds. And I know I'll lose more. I hate it. But I know that's not the end of the story. 
I know God is with me. God will be with me through it. When I have to face that moment for myself, I know God will be with me through that. I can trust that God will be with my kids and my wife with that and whoever cares about me beyond that. <laughs> Hopefully they still care for me at that point. We'll, we'll see. But I have confidence that God is with us, that it's going to be okay because God is good. And then we examine our assumptions in light of the facts. So in light of Holly's horrible death, and the rest of my life to live and to raise my daughter and to not live in terrible fear, it's going back to the facts and realizing, okay, odds are really, really good. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And if I, if I have trouble with that, then I need to an attack my anxieties with action. What this might look like is I, I might just need to get out a stack of Post-it notes and just write on the Post-it note, uh, facts are my friends just as a reminder, a general reminder, and put it on my bedroom uh, mirror, put it on uh, the bathroom mirror, put it on my dashboard, put it on the way out my door, put it on my refrigerator, wherever I'm going to see it to remind me, facts are my friends. And if I need it more detailed than that, then just say, there's a 99.9955% uh, chance that Lakin is going to avert that kind of a horrific life experience. And knowing that helps a lot. And counselors, if that's not enough, counselors are able to do amazing things now that they didn't know they could do uh, even a generation ago. Profoundly incredible things with neuro-linguistic processing that has helped who knows how many guys with PTSD break through or people of victims of violent crimes break through. It's real, and it's awesome, and it's good. And then finally, after I've worked this, to release my cares to God, to just say, God, I, I am not in control. I know that. I'm along for the ride. Everything about the trajectory of what you've created is generally good, and I'm going to enjoy the ride as much as I can. But I am going to trust that you're with me in the good and the inevitable bad. This life. And you're going to be with me every step of the way. You are never going to let go. You're always going to be there. Your love never fades. It never gives up. You'll never give up on me. And that's how we get through it. So if you're dealing with crime or something else, start the process. Meditate on it. Let it work for you. Because God doesn't want you to live in fear. It's not coming from God. God is not given you a spirit of fear, Paul says to his protege Timothy, but of power and love and self-discipline. That's something to build a life on. Let's pray together. So God, as we, um, as we wrap up this talk, first and most, thank you. Thank you that we can go back to the very beginning of the Jewish story of who they discovered you to be over centuries of time and identified you through their real life experiences of ups and downs, of mistakes on their part and redemption on your part that they could confidently say to a world who didn't know it and couldn't believe it that you are essentially very good, very good, gracious, compassionate, with us, redeeming, restorative. That's who you are, and that's who you remain. So if we struggle in fear right now for who knows how many different things, help us open up to you, Help us lean into you for solace. I'm kind of picturing a, a kid, you know, a young kid, even a toddler who's scared of the thunder or whatever, and the kid just burrows into the chest of the parent. That's, that's the picture I see for us. Can you help us do that, God? To be humble enough to realize that we can and that that's welcome and desired by you because you want us to live with hope and not fear? May that be our image as we face whatever down that we're facing. 
May we truly believe you are with us and for us to transform the worst into something that is even beautiful, that you trade beauty for ashes, strength for fear, gladness for mourning, and peace for despair. May that be in our memory all the time. And as we can find ourselves being able to walk with greater strength, we will thank you for being with us through it all, uh, unfailingly. You never let go. Thank you. Amen.